Recording in progress, she says. That sounds good. Okay, go for it. Great. So, good morning. How are you doing today? Very, very good. Thank you. Great. Um, so, Ziv, thanks for the time today. Um, I, I got your details from one of your other recordings. I think it popped up in either you, YouTube or LinkedIn. I can't remember which. Um, and I found it a very interesting conversation. So I thought I would reach out and uh, talk to you about um, kind of an idea I have. So I'll give you some background on it and then um, you know, see uh, if you can give us some insight into this topic. So essentially, um, you know, I, I live in Japan now, recently moved here about a year ago, but I've been uh, in Japan for about six years prior to that, like on a work assignment. And um, I was in the management consulting industry, worked, like I said, about six years in Tokyo, but I've spent my whole life really working across the globe. And, um, you know, my wife and I decided to get married, settle down. She's a physician and can only practice in Japan because she doesn't have a license to practice anywhere else. Um, and so, she, sorry. She's Japanese, your wife? Yes, she is. Yeah, she's Japanese. Understood. And, um, so, so we decided to make um, Tokyo our home base and I retired from my co consulting position and I started a tech firm um, which deals in supply chain digital technology and so we've only just started that up and uh, I'm able to run it remotely so Tokyo works for me. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually splitting my time between London uh, and Tokyo but due to corona um, I kind of came over here and decided not to go back uh, just because of the virus situation. That was about uh, January of last year. So it's so just you, when- Just to help me understand, your client base is in uh, overseas or here in Japan? Actually, mostly overseas. Um, okay. So uh, we, we will be addressing the Japanese market, but um, you know, I've been in Japan long enough to know that it's, it's a whole different ball game uh, selling to the Japanese. And uh, we want to be at, at the correct level of maturity before you even start to have conversations with the Japanese market. Uh, Japanese uh, businesses tend to like to see um, others try, like if it's a new solution or something new, they don't like to go first. They like to actually see uh, some traction in the rest of the world and then they'll be a follower, uh, especially when it comes to new technologies and things like that. So that's just the nature of the game here. Um, and that's, that's not a problem for us. You know, we understand that. Um, now, which brings me to, you know, my, my sort of personal portfolio is not invested in real estate at all. In fact, uh, if I look at all the homes I've owned over my life, I don't think I've really had a great experience with real estate. Um, just been, it's been very illiquid. Um, and then times where you do want to sell, sometimes it can be challenging. Um, last home I owned was in San Francisco. Um, so it was actually really easy to, you know, to exit that position. Um, but a home that I had in Chicago, for example, um, attracted a lot of taxes, uh, like around 3% tax per year. So a very sort of declining um, asset, if you will. So when in Japan, I was um, initially looked at um, some ideas to uh, basically diversify my portfolio into some real estate assets. And um, initially, I had been very interested in the renovation idea because my wife and I saw a lot of renovated um, homes uh, in Tokyo that were actually done really nicely and um, seemed like, you know, there was potential for a good margin there on that type of business. So I was actually thinking about uh, doing that as sort of a part-time thing, but uh, it seemed like there was a lot of uh, red tape and, um, you know, you had to have real estate license and all sorts of other things to actually do that. At it's least not, what it's I not exactly the case. Um, you do, if you purchase them as an individual and then you resell them within five years, you're facing double capital gains tax. Yes. Um, but if you purchase it under the name of a company, and it can be any company, it doesn't have to be a real estate company, and then you can sell it and not be subject to that double tax uh, within the first five years. If you start doing this as a regular business, though, um, you do need to be a real estate company. But I don't think you have to apply for a um, Taken license because you're not really doing um, real estate transactions per se. As far as I'm aware, 
Um, you just need to register a company that's whose designated purpose is to deal in real estate. Um, but you're not, acting, you're not acting as a broker, so I don't think you'll have to go the full gamut of the licensing. Well, that's that's interesting. It's certainly something to explore. And, um, you know, when my wife and I were looking for um, an apartment in Tokyo, we, we did come across a number of companies that were doing um, a lot of renovations on older buildings, um, which were at attractive price points. To be honest with you, the same square footage um, would be double. You know, we ended up buying um, uh, a small two-bedroom place in Nakamaguro. And... Um, paid about half the price of a new construction home for the same uh, square meterage um, at that point. So I don't know if the market was just yeah, a little soft. I'm, I'm home with the cats today. So they're, they're having a, a bit of a chat in the background. <laughs> I'm, uh, my dogs are walking around too, so I apologize for that. Um, so yeah, that was initially pretty attractive, but um, you know, I've got to thinking about a very unique idea that um, you know has to do with COVID and the you know current situation, and maybe I can just explain it. Um, I'll just sorry, I'll just pause you for a second and let her out. Otherwise, I won't be able to hear you. <laughs> Give me a second. Okay. That's it. Now all we need is for my son to come in and we'll be set. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, go for it. Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, I've always had the desire to own a, you know, I think like any professional that works in the city a lot, you, you, you have a desire to get out and to, you know, have some place in the countryside where you can decompress and, you know, do your own thing. I cycle a lot in Japan. So, you know, having a base somewhere in the mountains would be great for cycling with my friends, things like that. Um, but the downside of that for me is it feels like if the property isn't used a lot, then I actually feel like I've sort of added to the, you know, sort of footprint of, you know, it's not a sustainable kind of, um, you know, idea, I think it's something needs to be used in order to, you know, get the most out of it. So I was thinking recently that, um, you know, with COVID and with the special type of situation that is in Tokyo, where a lot of executives are struggling to work from home. Um, that, and I'm not saying that this would be the answer to it, but I think it would be a bit of a relief to the work from home situation. The working um, sort of resort or? or yeah, get... I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking about uh, like a mini or micro uh, executive retreat uh, conference center, um, but it also could be a place where families could go for, you know, um, a weekend or what have you, or it could be family reunion type of thing. Um, what I'm thinking about is a configurable mixed use area, which would be um, a large area similar to a very large living room. And I'm thinking like 150 to 200 square meters uh, with a, a very, very large and um, highly specced out kitchen that would have the ability to maybe have four people cooking at once, right? So have a centralized cooking facility, and then um, around that, you would have living area like, you know, couches, <clears throat> tables, um, which during the morning would be facilitating breakfast and in the afternoon, early evening would be doing dinner. But during the day, it could be configured into a work area where small teams could work together or individuals. Um, you could have some parts of the area be um, private, like a small private room. So if you wanted to have a small a conference uh, call or something like that, or a meeting, you could basically use that space. We could put a uh, big screen TV so people could project their laptops and things like that. So really a, a very mixed use space. And the idea actually comes from a property in Tokyo that I, um, that I know quite well, and it's it's called Waves Nihonbashi, mm -hmm. and it's in, it's in Hamacho, and it's a very interesting concept, and the group that owns this building has many of these across the city, and what it is, is 
Um, it's, the, the one in Hamacho is a new building. It's 50 units, very, very small rooms that are, you know, 15 square meters. And they only have a bathroom, a toilet, and uh, just an area for a bed and a small um, fridge, for example. Looking but at it, they have, I've just brought yeah, it up. They have, yeah. they have a very beautiful um, kitchen area, basically two layers of their top floor. That's uh, for is like a, a big open plan kitchen where yeah. they have three stove tops. Um, all high-end equipment like Le Creuset pots and pans and uh, global knives and things like that. Uh, beautiful uh, space. I'm looking at it now. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, floor to ceiling windows, uh, views of Tokyo Tower, uh, a huge um, dining table, which during the day people eat at and, at, and at, uh, during, the, sorry, during the morning people eat at, at, at night as well. But then people use it as a um, place to work, you know. There's workstation areas around it. And then there's a second floor on top of that, which is the rooftop, which has another kitchen, like a um, small living area with couches and that, and then a beautiful deck where there's barbecue capability and things like that. They've got laundry facilities. And it's really attractive for young professionals, um, especially those that are you know single and living alone. Uh, hey, because you get... They look like they're renting it with actual leases. I don't see a daily use uh, unless yeah, I'm that is sorry, that's that's a lease. That's definitely like a rental um, apartment type yeah. deal. But I what the, the the interesting part of it to me was seeing how Japanese and foreigners um, use the, the mixed use space or the, the shared space. And I think it works really well in Japan because Jap Japanese people are inherently clean and respectful. Mm. and quiet and and so that whole you know there's, there's there's good harmony there put it that way um so what i was thinking about is how, can you expand that concept to put it in a in a beautiful area somewhere where you have just this you know the front and center piece is this um mixed use shared space and then what you do is you put um i've seen these really nice um cabins like little log cabins um, which are like about 10,000 US dollars each. Yep. And I think fully equipped for like 15,000, maybe um, you could put, you know, six to 10 of those on a property, depending on how, how big it is. Yep. And that would be like glamping, if you will. So you could make it nice inside with really nice, um, you know, bedding and, and a desk and everything else. And mm. then the, 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 the sort of bathing facilities uh, would be similar to like like you know when you go to the golf course in Japan you've got you've got your locker and you've got your showers and you've got a nice um, you know sort of um, heated bath area I think something like that and um, people could enjoy the property and use it you know as as they want like I said from anything from executive and corporate outings um, conferences small conferences it could be a place where um, people who are up and coming chefs or want to start a restaurant could use it as a concept area where they try out their, you know, their, their menus and things like that, uh, get an experience on what it is like to, to cook at scale for people yeah. um, before they actually take on something, right? Or uh, extended be, family, well, it had to be a well-to-do yeah. family, but extended family getaway, uh, bring a few generations in for a weekend kind of thing. That's exactly right, right? Like a family reunion type area. And I think with, obviously with having, um, you know, more emphasis on the shared space being really, you know, I, I wouldn't say like super high end, but it's gotta be like really attractive and beautiful, um, you know, bringing in nature and things like that. And then I think with the offering the glamping style accommodation at night, you'd have a, a lower price. I'm thinking like, you know, um, uh, Ichiman Gosen Yen per person, maybe per night, something low like that, but because you're not getting a bathroom and, and, and that, but then try and, you know, make it, make it something that would be occupied a lot, a lot of the time. So just one second, my dog is now starting to <laughs> make the noise. Hey.
Sorry about that, Steve. Sorry. Yeah, um, all of this in the recording. I think people will like that. <laughs> Some, uh, yeah, as life happens, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, I think I think could be used for many different things. Like I said, I've got um, a lot of cycling friends that I think would like a weekend getaway or whatever, um, and a, a base where you could spend a couple of days exploring, you know, local mountains and things like that. Location um, wise, yeah. did, you, did you give some thought to? I'm assuming maybe yeah. up to two hours from Tokyo or so. Right, right. I think like one to one and a half, two hours by train from Tokyo. It's got to be convenient. Yeah. Um, you know, that's my my. I think my challenge right now is figuring out what location would be great. Um, I know the like the Kurizawa area is like you know super attractive. Super. Obviously, very expensive. <laughs> very expensive i did find a piece of land there and i don't know if it's um i'm trying to contact the realtor right now um it's like three thousand square meters which i'm not sure if it's big enough but i think it might be good enough to start with and it was only like 25 you're looking, million for, so you're looking for vacant land you're going to construct the facility i mean the cabins obviously I, are brought over but the facility you're going to be constructing from scratch yeah i I think so, unless I could find um, unless I could find an existing structure that uh, could be added onto in a in a way or reconfigured, because it would also be nice having that older sort of Japanese style of you know if you did find an older Japanese yeah yeah you know like I saw saw a really interesting house in Melbourne on on YouTube where the front is one of these period cottages you know old Victorian cottages. And then as you go through it, it goes into a modern uh, glass scape, if you will, in the back overlooking this gorgeous, you know, yard, which has a lot of foliage. Um, so, you know, something like that could work as well, I guess, if you can find an architect or someone to, you know, to mix the styles. Yep. Uh, it could, uh, could be quite interesting to do that. It would be attractive for foreigners, I think, because they all want the sort of Japanese experience. Well, I guess... Um, but I one of the just one major question that keeps popping into my mind as you explain this, I think the property side of things wouldn't be the um, wouldn't be the biggest hurdle. I'm just wondering if do you have the time and the bandwidth to market this and run because this is a full on business. I mean, this is not going to be something that you would be uh, advertising for tenants and running with a property manager, right? Yeah, I think um, so. There's a couple of different paths to go with it. Um, I, th I think you're right. Um, you have to have some type of marketing, web presence, that type of thing. Fortunately, I know how to do all of. I know how to do the the technical side of all of that. But having someone, I think I would have to hire someone locally who had some knowledge in in how to market a property like that. Yeah. Um, I was thinking. Um, this side, I mean, it might be fairly easy um, to market it to expats and foreigners. Uh, living in Japan or or maybe um, com like like coming to Japan for business conferences and so forth. But if you don't want to limit yourself to just the foreigner aspect, then you will definitely need a, a Japanese marketing company for that. Yes, I think so. So I'll actually add that to my list. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the other thing that I was thinking about doing is I could also um, use part of the facility for my own business. Um, you know, if I have a couple of developers I want to hire and things like that here locally in Japan, uh, we could we could put the business there so that um, I can also be on site more often. I think yep. um, that might be some part of it. Um, the other idea I had is um, to have maybe a competition um, at an architectural school where we give like you know ten thousand dollars to the winner or whatever it is for the best student proposal for this concept right and and then get a young because then i'd be helping a young architect get some experience under their belt as well um, so i've got a number of innovative ideas about how to um you know sort of go about this um, and but the the central idea is you know mixed use space that could be highly occupied and highly you know with high utility in other words it can be configured to do a bunch of different things and therefore its occupancy, occupancy rate should be you know, higher than, than average. 
um, and therefore it's being used more often. Um, and I think if we can do that in like a sustainable way, add in solar or geothermal or something like that into it, um, that would be attractive as well. And then I think long term, um, it's either I'd like to see how it goes and it might be an interesting it might be interesting to um, start it up, get it going, and then sell it as a as an actual business based upon you know cash flow valuation or something like that. Um, so I could see multiple returns on on an investment like that if it if it got to driving the financial results that that we needed to. to. Um, otherwise, it would just be you know like a you know family owned project. I think. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, that's that's the general idea. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, getting started, you know, just different locations. Um, I, I like the Kurizawa idea. I know getting in there is going to be extremely expensive from a land perspective, um, but I'm still trying to do research in terms of other other locations. Well, the uh, when I the um, there'll also be the topic of. Um running a business zoning restrictions because if you're having people um, stay overnight uh, you're going to be running under a hotel license i guess so right yeah. so how do people normally do their sorry go ahead how, how do people normally operate their airbnbs in japan is it all under a hotel license or something like that um if it's a smaller operation and you don't mind running it only half the year you can apply for a, a minpaku license which is um casual short-term stay but various areas will have various restrictions on that um since late 2018 the government gave uh, local municipalities the right to uh, limit that practice in their own jurisdictions. Um, so some of them are more lenient, some of them less. So in some cases, for example, if you want a minpaku license, you have to have a, a person within a certain distance of the property 24 hours. Um, so okay. you have to have a full-time staff there, but that, that I think would apply for the hotel license as well. Mm -hmm. You would need to have a staff on site uh, so maybe look into getting somebody who's interested in maybe living out in the countryside who can just live in one of those cabins and then cater to the guests when there is an event. Right, right. And, yeah, you definitely need help with that. Yeah. And there's other compliance involved. So let, let's say the area, hotel licenses are usually less challenging. I mean, there would be um, hotels in every municipality. Casual Minpaku Airbnb is a bit more challenging, but I think from what you're describing, a hotel license is definitely the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't want to be limited in just uh, being able to operate half the year and so forth. Um, and obviously in both cases, there's compliance with fire and safety requirements. The architectural plan has to uh, run through city hall for them to approve that it's uh, acceptable for a hotel. And there's certain there's certain, again, it might differ a little bit between municipalities, but uh, floor space of the common areas versus floor space of the sleeping areas have to run a certain ratio. I see. Um, there has to be something equivalent to a reception desk of some sort. That's not really a huge limitation. It can be just a few tables that function as that. Um, so depending on location, it might be a good idea before you actually um, go and put offers on properties, it might be a good idea to first check with the local municipalities and see what exactly they're requesting for a hotel license, what you'll need to comply with, and also to sort the staffing out. So again, the, the, what the property itself and even the architectural and design side, I think are the easiest hurdles to get through here. There are, like you said, there are plenty of options there. Um, the business side of things, so the licensing, and honestly, this will rise and fall on marketing and advertising. Um, to the expat, I mean, we can definitely start with the expats, but to the Japanese side, there'll have to be some uh, careful thought given to who's going to be doing that, where to advertise, whether it's on the uh, Rakuten and Agoda and all of the typical uh, booking websites that people go through or through other venues. So it would be a good idea to maybe talk to somebody who's been running um, hotels or conference centers as a company for other people and see how they advertise to the Japanese market. Yes. Um, and the license 
interesting. So let's say we're looking at Kuroizawa, but if Kuroizawa is uh, requests for hotel licensing are going to uh, you know bring up your expenses 100%, there's no really point in going there. That's right. I see. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. So I I think I need to think through um, definitely a lot a lot of that piece of um, piece of the puzzle. Are there? Um, just two more questions. Number one, you said you were contacting local realtors. Um, I'm assuming that means you're okay with them um, uh, written, uh, reading and writing and, and communicating in Japanese. Um, I I think we can handle reading and writing in Japanese um, between myself and my wife, of course. Um, but I haven't hired any local um, realtors. Have I've just reached out to you know one buyer online. Um, just They're back. Have they been communicative? Because sometimes they. No. Tend no, no, that's the that's, that's, that's what I that's the that's the problem. And you kind of I mean, I must tell you that I think um, real estate in Japan uh, is a little bit behind um, at least the US. Uh, you know, the, the the properties, what I found very frustrating is lack of really great images about mm. properties in Japan. Like Japanese websites are terrible, quite frankly. A lot of times don't even have um, you know, photographs of inside of people's homes of course that's a challenge but if you look at markets like san francisco new york um la chicago you know they they come in and they they basically stage the entire house with stage furniture make it look terrific get a professional photographer in they and, do uh, very high-end properties here but right. not for the uh, countryside sort of locations that you're looking at i mean they're, they're, a lot of yeah, them country have flip phones and just take pictures like that yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. So, so yes, I need some, you know, probably need some help um, on the real estate side of things as well. Um, but, you know, I think next steps is for me to just sort of put together a financial model and try and um, do some more research and investigation into these areas that you're talking about. With the license, um, just a, a little tip. I mean, we can obviously yeah. do that for you as well, but if you want to try it on your own with the licensing, the best way to do it is to find a... A shihoshoshi, a judicial scrivener, uh, who can access uh, city hall for you and get you all the requirements for uh, hotel licensing, because you'll definitely need that whichever area you're considering. And they're usually not too expensive. I mean, for up to uh, fifty or hundred bucks per inquiry, they'll be able to get you the information that you need. Okay. And hopefully it'll be a bilingual one, so they can also. Uh, oh, I guess your wife could help you with that if she's got the time on her hands, maybe to uh, parse the uh, requirements and and uh, translate them for you. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, there will be a lot of uh, legalese and uh, uh, hardcore keigo and kanji in those documents, so it's it's not a it's not like a sign on the street. I'm sure I do have a local accountant who's bilingual. Um, who can, I think, help me with things like that legal side of things and setting up a company and, and stuff like that. Not, not that, I mean, I, uh, just visiting City Hall and asking them or oh, no, yeah. by phone and asking them for their requirements for a hotel license in that area. I see. No, I understood. What I mean is after that, dealing with any of the legal documents and that, I do have <laughs> some, I do have some help from my, um, you know, tax accountant and that I think could help me there too. Um, so I, I guess a couple of other questions I had was um, the how, how does it generally work accessing um, capital like loans for construction in in Japan? Is it something that's done and available, or is it um, more, much more tricky than buying you know an, an existing house? It depends on your personal circumstances and on the purpose of the construction. So the first thing is you have to have at least a year, preferably two or three years of income generated in Japan, either as an individual or a company. And they'll consider like if you have a company and it's under your name, then they'll consider your individual history as collateral, as a history for the company, income history for the company. Um, but the income has to be generated in Japan. So either with uh, invoices from the company itself or as a, as a salaried employee of the company, you have to have at least two years of income history. And then the other side of that is they're definitely open to construction loans for personal residences. For investment purposes, most of the lenders would be a lot more comfortable with a straight out residential property uh, business plan. 
something like you're describing might be a bit more challenging. Um, if you're looking at buying a property to just tenant it out, um, that's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. uh, for something like this, you'd have to be in a pretty good relationship with your um, bank, I think, for them to consider that. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, but um, it, could be, it could be an interesting concept to float to a joint venture rather than go with traditional lenders, because I can think about uh, quite a few investors that would be interested in that. Yeah, that's the other thing I was thinking. Yeah, I would be open to having other investors come in on this if we can put together a tight enough business plan that we all believe, you know, would be something that would be achievable. Um, so that's that's certainly um, that's certainly up. And I've raised money from my own company before, so I think I understand the process of that a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's that's certainly an option. Are you think you're thinking like just private market? private market exactly. if you're under 50 investors you don't fall under crowdfunding legislation so you can pretty much set up a, any sort of vehicle and just do it that way um and i know i i can think of at least two or three of our customers who have shown interest in a joint venture in the past who would be quite interested in that sort of model i think and obviously the the lower the entry cost, uh, which means the larger the number of investors, um, the easier it would be uh, in the recruitment phase. But then um, management and admin might be a bit more challenging if you've got more investors. So there's a bit of a balance point to be struck there. Yeah, no, I, de I definitely understand the nuances of that for sure. Mm. I've, I've been, been down that road a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask how... Uh, is, is Japan, does Japan have a concept of refinancing mortgages or um, home equity lines of credit or anything like that? Um, you can't really draw on your equity um, for a refinancing or for another project. As far as I'm aware, the, the banks and the lenders would let you know on that one, but I haven't heard of that being done. And they're yeah. really going to limit your borrowing capacity depending on, again, your income history and what you've been generating, not the equity of the assets. Uh, okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, because you know in the US it's very easy to get access to your capital. Um, yeah. pretty straightforward. And obviously refinancing is more of a uh, national sport in, in the US. <laughs> yeah. Interest rate exchange. Uh, it is well, but uh, not, not, done, not done in Japan now. Yeah, we'd love to do that because um, you know we purchased our original home in Nakamagura for cash, so we got cash locked up in it. Um, but that was because, like you said, in terms of um, uh, borrowing, uh, my my wife was a contract physician for a couple of hospitals and clinics, and even though you know it's a it's a great vocation and very well respected uh, profession, uh, they wanted to see her being you know, uh, permanently employed by a hospital or a clinic for a certain period of time. Um, so that was a challenge. So we, we eventually just decided to forego a mortgage and, and, and uh, buy a home for cash. But the problem is now we've got it cash locked up in our place. So I honestly, uh, I honestly think your concept is a lot more attractive to a joint venture than it would be to traditional Japanese lenders. I don't see them getting behind this unless you've got quite a few of these projects under your belt that you can show them. Right, right. No, Maybe that, and that makes sense. That's the first one. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't expect the Japanese banks to go anywhere outside of the lines, right? So, fortunately, <laughs> doesn't know. Sure, understood. Um, but you know, what I was thinking is, uh, you know, like I said, to try and provide some type of relief. That's why I wanted to make the. I want to try and make the cost per night not exorbitant and super high end because. If we can kind of attract some professionals from the city that need to just get away for a week and get some work done. Well, um, it, it's 9% per cabin or per person or per cabin, maybe it might be a couple, um, I think is definitely doable. It's, um, well, I mean, depending on the, 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 the bath facilities would be a big uh, turn on or turn off as well. We need to see what we can do with that. Yeah, that's what I, you know, what I was, look, uh, I just thought like if it could work, it would work in Japan because people, you know, are definitely um, more open to the communal bathing. And I've been to some ryokans and places like that where the, you know, you just had a room and there was a co communal bath area. 
So I'm, I, I, yeah, I don't know. You're also marketing to expats. Uh, some of them, even those who have been living in Japan for a long time, are still a bit iffy. <laughs> Wouldn't like that. I know. I understand. Um, you know, uh, we, we could do something like um, an outdoor shower or something like that on each cabin. Um, I personally think I, I love outdoor showers. I mean, I've stayed in a number of homes that have actually had that, like in South Africa and places like that. So um, that's actually been um, really like a highlight, but I'm not sure if people would uh, nat naturally go for that. Um, well, same, yeah, as cater, same as you want to cater to the widest clientele potential base in what you offer within the facility itself, I would think that the bathing options should also accommodate most of them. So that might be might need a bit more thought on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think definitely it might drive up the cost model um, significantly, but I would have to I'd have to look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Generally. Um, that's the that's the idea and I, I don't know if you had any guidance on in terms of how to select you know areas I, I i know japan but not as well as a lot of locals and obviously expats that have been here longer than me but like i said i do a lot of cycling in the um mountains and that and there's i'm always seeing just beautiful uh, areas where you know you've got mountains you've got forests you've got um, you know, rivers, uh, you know, the kind of places that I've stayed at, um, onsen style places like outside Hakone and those areas, mm. um, you know, gorgeous. Uh, and I think there's got to be some land that's, um, you know, that, that's available out there because I did notice uh, one area of Hakone that we went to recently um, as we were walking through the neighborhood, which had like very, very large um, pieces of land. Um, a lot of the homes just looked like nobody was living there, you know, they, they were, and I'm guessing it's like that I IKEA type deal. So, you know, I'm also going to start exploring that. Well, land, yeah. land and old homes are available pretty much anywhere in Japan and usually rather cheaply. Um, yeah. The trick is, again, uh, number one, accessibility. So we want to make sure that um, people... Exactly. I mean, the train would, I, I'm just thinking, the train would only come to the center of the local municipality, whatever that may be. So to get from there to the resort, you'll probably have to work out a, a pickup truck arrangement or something similar. Um, but yeah, in, beyond that, I would look at, again, I would look at the local municipality and how easy it would be to operate uh, under a hotel license there. So that would be another primary selection criteria. So maybe narrow down a few locations that are accessible from Tokyo within the, uh, like you mentioned, an hour and a half or so, and then hire a local Shiho Shoshi in each of those areas to try and get the licensing requirements and maybe base a decision on that because available properties will be anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes the sense. are not very communicative um, when approached by foreigners, but once you get a job, this is basically what we do for our customer. We give them a Japanese face to work with and we promise them they'll never have to talk to the scary gaijin on the other end and then things get a bit smoother. So that's usually not an issue. The properties will be available. They will be pretty cheap, but I would look at accessibility and licensing first and then start looking at potential properties based on those results. Yeah, I know. I think that that's great. Until until Elon Musk and Tesla solve the completely autonomous vehicle, then I can have a Tesla pick them up on the, on the station. I, I I honestly don't think that that's too far away. Yeah. Um. So you know, I joke with my wife that yeah, we should buy a Tesla because when the software upgrade comes, um, that that car is going to be fully autonomous, and I could honestly see a future where, you know, the guests get off the train and. There's a Tesla waiting there, and they just jump in it, and it drives them straight to the. To I the think place so. I mean, we'll probably see it in bigger cities. I don't think it'll uh, be accessible in the countryside until 5G is rolled out, and that's probably looking like another five to ten years at least. Mm. Yeah, could be, could be, could be some constraints around that. So, um, anyway, uh, I, I, I know a lot of smart people are working on that problem because there's a huge upside to it. Um, so I don't think I'm dreaming in that respect. I think that that's going to be reality at some point. Um, but uh, yes, certainly accessibility. I think was like the first thing my wife asked was, you know, 
how far is this property from the train station? Um, yeah. To normal Japanese response. Um, but that's been super helpful. Thanks. If it's a corporate retreat, it's not, I think, beyond beyond the reason to think that they would be probably renting a little bus or a minibus, depending on how many people are coming in. So for the corporate retreat crowd specifically, that might not be the biggest issue, but anything that's of a more private nature, then yes, people might be coming by train, they might be coming by car, we just don't know. So. Makes sense. Okay. Um, that's... I think that, that that was most of what I wanted to cover, but I did want to give you some opportunity to tell uh, your viewers uh, a little bit more about your services and what you offer. And so I can also understand that a little bit more deeply as well. Yep, my pleasure. So we, um, I mean, the viewers probably know this. Most of them uh, have been watching. <laughs> but we've been, um, what, what we act as exactly as that point that you've described. So we're the um, sort of bridge between the, um, the scary gaijin and the confusing Japanese entities and professionals that people need to work with. So what we normally do for them is uh, on more standard property purchases, uh, this is not you, but we do just uh, market research. We let them know which available properties are in their particular criteria, whether it's um, location or budget or distance from station or what have you. And then we look at options for negotiation if they exist, depending on the area. In central Tokyo, it's going to be a bit tougher, but anything, for example, vacant properties in the countryside are a lot easier to negotiate. And then we contact the listing realtor. Again, we present uh, ourselves as a proxy of the buyer and telling, uh, showing him the legal documents that enable us to work on their behalf in Japan. And then the realtor is, uh, and the seller are satisfied that they won't have to deal directly with foreigners, which um, usually then opens the doors to, I'd say, maybe 80, 90% of the market, as opposed to the 30 or 40% that's usually open to foreigners. And then we, the way it works in Japan is you first, depending again on location and how popular the uh, properties are, if it's a central city location or a very attractive holiday property, you would need to submit an offer first and then start getting due diligence info on the property. Um, in other cases, if it's been on sale for a while, um, then the agent would already have this information pre-offer, but in, it is a very fast market. So attractive properties, the best idea is to get your foot in the door with an offer. And on the offer, we would note that it's pending due diligence info. So if we're not satisfied with the structural info or the layout of the land or subject to inspection or whatever the case may be. And then and if, if you, sorry, go is ahead. Earnest, is, is like earnest money um, paid at that point? Some no. Type of, um, no. no, okay. No, but there is a um, moral or sort of politeness obligation that if due diligence does check out okay, then the buyer is going, it's assumed that the buyer is going to proceed with the deal. So we can pull an offer back if for any reason we then receive due diligence info that's less than satisfactory. But if we do that without any um, reasonable uh, reasonable excuse, then that particular realtor is not going to work with us. And we're just going to reinforce the image that gaijins are tire kickers. So we, we try to avoid that. It's always a, a bit of a challenge in Japan. So assuming the property and the numbers and the budget works out and assuming the due diligence is satisfactory, we would then proceed to sign a contract at which point we're going to review the legal documents attached to the property just to make sure that everything we've been told is actually on paper as well. And before that, we might, if the seller allows, we might do some inspections that would be at the buyer's expense, but depending. So if you're looking at land for construction, it might be a good idea to check um, the solidity of the land to make sure that construction is going to go through smoothly. If you're looking at an existing structure, uh, maybe a structural inspection is a good idea. Um, again, depending on the budget, I mean, if you're buying something for 20,000 bucks, no one's going to, it's what you see is what you get. But if you're going for the uh, upper echelons, it's a good idea to get them inspected. And then if everything goes smooth, we sign the contract, we pay the deposit, which is traditionally 10%. Mm -hmm. And then probably three to four weeks after that, if the buyer is in Japan and all the documentation is uh, provided from within Japan, will go on to settlement. If the buyer or the documentation needs to arrive from overseas, it could take six to eight weeks. Okay. And that's usually it. And then the other things we can assist with is um, organizing for construction companies, renovation companies, 
property management, if it's a standard um, long-term or even short-term lease, there are definitely, uh, there's a gamut of property managers and um, short-term stay operators in Japan, depending on the area. The more you're out in the countryside, the less these are feasible. Yeah. But in your case, in any case, we're not going to be using a property manager. I think this would be, a, you'd need to run your own advertising and marketing platform. And taking bookings and billings and so forth. I don't, I don't see... I don't see a typical Japanese property manager, whether long or short term, uh, that's able to handle these sort of things. What about Airbnb for something like this? As a, Airbnb, as a platform just to get started even? Um, it is possible once you satisfy the licensing requirements, you're not going to be able to put it on Airbnb before you show them a hotel or Minpaku license. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. You'd have a hotel license. You could always use Airbnb as standard, additional yeah, no for standard booking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But to, to okay. satisfy the license requirements, you'll need to show the uh, licensing authority um, the management uh, infrastructure that you've got in place. So whether it's a person who's always at the property or someone who's within okay. call, depending. On, so all of that will have to be worked out before that. Once you've received the license, then yes, you can list on any of the platforms. I see. Okay. You still yeah, need that's somebody that's to handle guest check-in, check-out, and billing. I mean, Airbnb might be able to handle the billing for you. Um, yeah, but- uh, billing is becoming billing is becoming easier and easier these days. Um, yeah. You know, I've built uh, billing uh, mechanisms on you know my company's website, for example. Um, you know, a company called Stripe ha- handles all yeah. of that for you. Um, there's a fee that you have to pay, but um, it's completely seamless. So you can put that on any website these days. Um, I think uh, in terms of having someone out there full time, I think that that would be mandatory. Like you'd want somebody who takes care of the property and is also able to handle guests. And they have to be a bilingual, don't forget about that. Oh, absolutely. And I would, I would think this would be a Japanese person um, that, that would do that. Well, then they would, would, be would have to be proficient in English, at least. <laughs> they would have to talk a little bit of English, yes. It, it uh, pro- a bit of a challenge. So that's uh, easier said than done in many cases, especially if you're looking for somebody who wants to move out and just stay in the countryside, right? I, I, I totally understand. Um, well, I expect to spend a lot of my time there as well. Um, and, uh, but... Yeah, I think it would be great if that person also, um, you know, was a chef and they could they could cook as well for people. Um, so yeah, that's the idea is to just try and uh, see if I can put together a model um, and then pressure test it. Well, and, for, the, uh, for the first year or two, like you said, if you can, if your job can be handled remotely and if your wife doesn't mind, then for the first year or two, it would be a lot easier to apply for the licensing if you just say that you're going to be there twenty four seven, right? Right, right. And then have, uh, take care of the staffing as you as you move down the road and you see how easy or, or less uh, challenging or less challenging it is to actually populate the place, then you can start thinking about staffing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I think I think from you know, like I said, these days the technology is growing so quickly that the whole process of check-in, check out, billing, I think can be digitally managed. Um, yeah. It's the physical management of the property, you know, cleaning out rooms, making beds, things like that, making sure that the right linens are available and, and all of the other maintenance stuff that we can yeah. need. Well, for compliance, for compliance, that will have to be a part of it in any case. So the license yeah. uh, comes with a certain requirement to, uh, for hygiene, for fire, for safety, for a person on site. So uh, even though there are plenty of Airbnb and hotel spaces that are managed with uh, electronic uh, uh, check-in and check-out, um, there is still to comply. The, the company running the place still needs to show that the, uh, the cleaning and is done at a certain uh, frequency and that the person is uh, always present within a certain distance. So that still needs to be done. Okay. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you. I think you filled in quite a lot of gaps and um, I definitely would like to follow up with you on some of the services that you offer and um, also about the uh, JV uh, uh, interest in that, but before I take that step, I think I'd like to do a lot of homework because if I'm going to present to investors, yes. I want to have a full story. I'll need a business um, plan to uh, get them interested. Yes, yeah. I, don't worry, I understand that process. I've been there before. 
Yeah. So that, that's very good. Well, very helpful. Thank you a lot, uh, Ziv. It was lovely meeting you and um, appreciate the time that you've spent with me today. My pleasure. And um, would you like me to, um, on the recording or on the show notes, would you like me to um, put any way for people to contact you if they're interested in joining in or do you want us to yeah, collect? Sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, no, that would be fine. Yeah. So email address or your LinkedIn profile, what should I put there? Uh, we can, you can put both. So, okay. you know, my email address yep. and my LinkedIn profile. Um, and if people want to get touched with me about exploring the idea further, I would love nothing more to have more conversations around it. All right. So we'll do that. And maybe uh, we'll get some uh, advanced bookings as well. See how we go. <laughs> that would be excellent. Thanks, Thanks for your time. very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.